Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, and welcome to Mad and the Family, the podcast of Madden America's Parent Resources section. I'm Miranda Spencer, Parent Resources Editor. Today, we're going to talk about the role of human interaction in child development, specifically how conflict and miscommunication between parent and child is not only okay, but crucial to a young person's social and emotional development. According to our guest, the messiness of our relationships is exactly what helps us build trust, resilience, and a solid sense of self in the world. That is the subject of her latest book, which she is going to discuss with us. She is Claudia Gold, MD, a pediatrician, infant parent mental health specialist, author, teacher, and speaker based in Western Massachusetts. She has practiced general and behavioral pediatrics for more than 25 years, focusing on a preventative model, and now specializes in early childhood mental health. She's the director of the Hello, It's Me Project, a rural community-based program designed to promote healthy relationships between infants and caregivers, and also works as a clinician with First Steps Together, a federally funded program for pregnant and parenting women with opioid use disorders and as an infant parent mental health consultant at Volunteers in Medicine Berkshires. Dr. Gold serves on the faculty of the Infant Parent Mental Health Fellowship Program at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, the Brazelton Institute at Boston Children's Hospital, and the Berkshire Psychoanalytic Institute. Dr. Gold is the author of four books on child psychology and development, Keeping Your Child in Mind, The Silenced Child, The Developmental Science of Early Childhood, and most recently, The Power of Discord, written with Dr. Ed Tronick and published in 2020. Dr. Gold is the author of numerous articles, including Madden America blogs, and presents regularly for audiences of both parents and professionals around the world. Welcome. Hi. I want to talk first about what you do in your practice, which seems somewhat unique. Uh, What is behavioral pediatrics? And as a physician, what drove you to focus on early childhood mental health? So what I do is I have made myself my own little niche of practice, which I've uh, developed out of all the different sources of learning that I've accumulated over the years of my career. (laughs) So I started out way before I went to medical school, really being interested in children's healthy emotional development. Um, and that was through a number of different influences on my life. But I thought as a, as a pediatrician, I would be able to be right there from the beginning, even sometimes before the baby was born, to support the healthy development of the whole family. So while originally I was going to be a psychiatrist, uh, I changed course and decided to become a pediatrician. So I got trained in pediatrics, and I actually did a fellowship in what's called developmental and behavioral pediatrics which is a subspecialty of pediatrics. But I found that what I was learning wasn't really exactly what I was looking for. Um, And even though I ended up being in kind of what you'd say the right place at the right time, so I was practicing pediatrics uh, about uh, 10 years into my career, I landed in a very busy small town practice, like really on the front lines, going to deliveries in the middle of the night, really immersed in the lives of families, kind of exactly the way I wanted to be, uh, but I didn't really feel that any of my pediatrics training, including the subspecialty in developmental and behavioral pediatrics, had taught me things that were helping me. So I found that I had learned a lot about management of behavior, a lot about uh, diagnosis, and, I, uh, and increasingly about different medications to treat uh, behavior problems. And so when I would use that toolbox (laughs) um, that I had gathered in my training, I often experienced uh, a lot of frustration and failure for myself and for my my patients, where they would would do the things that we discussed, they would follow through on the behavior management techniques, and and there, there was still this kind of escalating distress in the family. And then I had a number of really fortuitous events happened. So first of all, uh, as I mentioned, I was in this very busy uh, small town practice and the Berkshire Psychoanalytic Institute opened uh, at a psychiatric hospital about 20 minutes from my house. 
And there I became a scholar. I didn't study, I didn't do psychoanalytic training, but I began to study psychoanalytic ideas. And I was introduced to people like uh, D.W. Winnicott, who um, was a kind of British Dr. Spock. I was interest, introduced to a whole range of contemporary research and knowledge that pediatricians just do not have privy to. It's, it's, a, it's a classic example of a silo, like where the, the knowledge is just in a different place from where pediatricians live. And I was able to gather this knowledge, and then I, I went on to, to train in a field called infant mental health which focuses on kind of an integration of genetics, developmental science, and neuroscience in a model of of prevention, intervention, and treatment. So I began to sort of learn all this stuff and then use it in my practice. So I was still uh, practicing as a pediatrician, but instead of doing the toolbox I had learned in my kind of traditional training, I began to use this other toolbox. And I began to see massive shifts in families in, in relatively short periods of time, huh. very dramatic shifts um, and, and really meaningful changes. So that's how I kind of got where I am today. I mean, I do a lot of other things now besides my own clinical practice, but in my clinical practice, I still do that same thing. I, I practice in the way that I've come to curate over the years of a whole range of different experiences I've had. Yeah, it sounds like you take a very individual and personalized approach to help struggling kids and parents who are struggling with those kids. Um, There's a quote on your website from your earlier book, The Silenced Child, that emphasizes the importance of listening to what a child's behavior is communicating. In general, what do you mean by that? Sort of going back to my traditional pediatrics training is a lot about managing behavior. So let's say a child is having... Uh, tantrums. A, a behavior management approach would be rewards for ending the tantrum or timeouts, things like that. But an approach that looks at what is the behavior communicating says, how is this child stressed in some way? Uh, and you know, I'll, just to give you an example, I saw a child, a family yesterday by Zoom. Very interesting new technology, <laughs> but. There they were. And actually, in some ways, it was better because I could see the child in her natural habitat. And there's a lot of meltdowns going on, like uh, all day long, Uh, you know, opposition, meltdown, no saying, you know, it's just like a mess. And so when you start to unpack it, listening to the story, and this is where you talk about the individualized approach, there are many different layers that help us to make sense of this situation. First of all, from birth, this child has always been very intense and kind of intense reactions to uh, tactile and sensory input, uh, just a very uh, intense child from, from as a newborn even. And then there were some stress er- in her early life where uh, there was some uh, postpartum depression. So things were very bumpy at the beginning of her life. Then things kind of smoothed out and things went well. And then there was two events. One was a new baby and the other was the COVID pandemic. And so this child's life was massively disrupted when she turned about four. So if you think, okay, so there are multiple meanings to her tantrums. That's, that's, what, that's what I'd say. So it's not like it's just a behavior and we have to figure out how to stop the behavior. We have to listen to the meaning of the behavior and by listening to it, that leads us to think about how to change things to improve the situation. That, like the, the behavior is a communication, like I need help here. What can we do as a family to make things work better? And then that involves uh, more you know, listening and kind of lots of different things that might happen to do that. Not, not a unit dimensional solution, not like CBT or behavior management or medication, but but like a whole slew of different things that involve, uh, you know, changing to the whole system. Now, your approach and the topic of your latest book draws heavily from research by Dr. Ed Tronick, something known as the still face experiment. Can you tell us what that is 
and what the subsequent, subsequent research has taught us about the development of children's emotional lives, personality, and how they view the world. Well, uh, first I'll tell you how Ed and I came to write the book together, so you can that will help to kind of integrate what I've just been saying with, with his research. Um, so back when I was learning all these new things, one of the things that I did learn about was his research. Uh, and he actually is this chief faculty of that program that I mentioned, the Infant Parent Mental Health Program. So I knew about the still face research uh, from that, but then when I began to work more closely with him, I learned about it in more depth, and then I was kind of able to integrate his model into what I had already observed in my practice. And then he asked me to write a book with him, and that led to this collaboration. Uh, and, and, and the model of listening that I was just talking about fits very well with the still face paradigm. But I'll tell you, what is the still face paradigm? Dr. Tronic's roots are uh, as an experimental psychologist. And he had the good fortune to team up with uh, Barry Brazelton, a renowned pediatrician um, who died about four years ago at the age of 99, who um, in his rounds, and, and Dr. Tronic was there with him, came to appreciate the tremendous capacity newborns have for communication and connection. So being an experimental psychologist, he designed an experiment to see just exactly how much did the baby contribute to the interaction. Because up until that time, which was like in the early 70s, even though attachment theory and the importance of the relationship was really uh, known and appreciated, it was generally thought that it was the parent, the, the mother usually at that time, who was running the show. Like the way the baby, the baby just like was a passive recipient of however the mother behaved. So he thought that that was probably wrong because in his rounds with Dr. Brazelson, he was seeing babies who were just a few hours old who could like differentiate between a voice and an object, who had ability to kind of shut down when they got overwhelmed had tremendous uh, uh, communication skills. So what he did was he designed what's called the still face experiment. And he, he decided what he would do is just eliminate the mother and see what the baby does if, the, if they're on their own in the interaction. Mm-hmm. So the way he did it is he would have the mother and the baby uh, face each other uh, and interact in typical play. And then the, the experimenter would have the mother have literally a still face, so not react to the baby. And immediately it was obvious that the baby played a huge role. And if you think about it, like the baby hasn't read any books, the baby doesn't <laughs> know anything really, they're four, six months old, but yet they bring out this whole host of repertoires of behaviors to get the mother's attention. They screech, they point, they arch. So, so they, they, it's like they're born in their bodies knowing how to get their mother back. (laughs) Hmm. And so, first of all, uh, it showed, it it was very, very dramatic. And it gave, like, the field of psychology, it was kind of revolutionary to show just how much of a role babies played uh, in how the relationship went. So out of that experiment grew uh, the still face paradigm. But the, the important part came after where he did detailed moment by moment analyses of of typical videotaped interactions. Um, And this sort of gets into the mismatch and repair idea. And he found that while we have this kind of mythic appreciation of this idea of attunement, like relationships should be perfectly smooth and relationships should be attuned and good relationships are always attuned, that in actual relationships, that's not the case. Um, And so that what, what he came to see, which is then the still face paradigm, is that typical healthy relationships are very messy and that the even though the the still face experiment can be disturbing to watch what it really shows is that the baby has had many 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 experiences of the mother not being there although not over such a long and obvious period of time so that the baby has learned in in her body how to feel like okay i got i got this i know what to do i can I have uh, a sense of myself and I, I have a hopeful sense of myself in the world. So, so that all together 
those those ideas are the still face paradigm. So the mother and child or parent and child relationship is kind of like a dance. It's not yes. the child is a lump of clay that gets gets molded. Yes, but it's more than that. It's a dance because it's a certain kind of dance. Mm -hmm. It's not a Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers dance. It's not a smooth, graceful, perfect dance. It's a very messy dance. It's like uh, um, Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey, you know, hmm. like where, you know, she pokes him in the eye and he steps on her foot. And it's a, it's a messy dance that through like the inevitable, because, you know, as people, we're just, we have our own individual sense of self, so we don't. We can never be inside another person's mind. We 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 inevitably don't quite get what another person intends, and it's by sort of missing them and then coming to a new understanding that that we grow both in our sense of self and in relation with other people to to eventually create the kind of you know, grand finale of Dirty Dancing. But, but, but it's, a, it's a developmental process. It's not just like this smooth, smooth, beautiful thing that appears out of nowhere. Which leads us to your new book, which is called The Power of Discord. And in that book, you take the still face paradigm as a jumping off point to talk about what you call mismatch and repair as a process for building a healthy parent and child relationship. So what is the mismatch and repair and why is that important to kids and I guess everyone's mental health? Well, the mismatch is gonna be there. This is what the research showed and anybody who's a parent or anybody who's been in any kind of a relationship will tell you that there are times where you miss each other's cues and you misunderstand each other and, and, and that's just human nature. Um, the, the mismatch part of it. But what the still face paradigm and the mismatch repair model shows is that the repair is where growth happens. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of like you need to have the mismatch in order to have the kind of pleasure of reconnecting. And that it's that pleasure that fuels the growth of ourselves and our relationships. So if we never have mismatch, then we don't grow. So another, um, uh, there's a lot in the book about, uh, in addition to Dr. Tronic's research about the work of someone who I mentioned before, the pediatrician D.W. Winnicott, who was a psychoanalyst and a pediatrician. And so his ideas grow out of clinical experience rather than research. But they're very similar, which is that, and he has this uh, concept, which is called, you may have heard of, the good enough mother. And the idea of the good enough mother, which sometimes it's sort of taken as a, as a sort of simplistic reassurance, like it's okay, you're going to make mistakes, don't worry about it. But really the concept of the good enough mother um, is that you have to make mistakes. Like if a mm. mother always gets their baby and is never allows for any mismatch, then the baby doesn't have that opportunity for repair and they don't develop their own kind of robust, healthy sense of self and self-confidence. Um, so, and, and that is the same idea as the mismatch repair that, that you, you need the mismatch, you need the times, you need not to have this expectation that everything is smooth and nice and that if it's not smooth and nice, you must be doing something wrong. You have to, as parents, embrace the messiness of it. Like, I'm going to lose my cool. You're going to have a tantrum. We're going to get upset with each other. It's going to look different depending on how old the child is, what these disruptions look like uh, or the discord. But they need to happen because you need the repair in order to grow and change. Hmm. It reminds me of parents often complaining, you know, my kid is so defiant or, or we fight all the time and, mm. you know, um, they must need therapy, they must need medication. And it almost sounds like those fights, maybe parents should look at as a maybe positive thing, or at least not something to worry about. Well, I don't know if it's worry about, because obviously if people are fighting all the time, it's just the family isn't functioning well. Hmm. But the question is, how do you understand it? And then what do you do about it? Because it's really that if 
if a, a parent is constantly saying no and, and they're constantly butting heads, you have a situation of, I like to think of that as, as unrepaired mismatch. So you're always missing each other and you're not repairing it. Um, and that's not good. But rather than smoothing it over, so sort of making the mismatch go away by, you know, things like behavior management and medication, it's, it's really the opposite is to say, okay, let's really get into the mismatch here. Sort of like that story I started the, our discussion with. It's very complicated and messy. There's lots of different meanings to the child's behavior. And we, we didn't even add in the whole layer of what a parent brings to the situation. So let's say you had uh, an abusive parent so that they would uh, humiliate you or hit you, you know, when, when you misbehave. And now your child is misbehaving. All of that stuff comes to the surface. So rather than say, okay, this child is misbehaving, let's stop the behavior let's really get into the messiness of all, what is this all about? And let's unpack the layers of it so we can find our way to repair. And that repair might take, uh, as I said, many forms. Um, and and then in, in the book towards the end, we have a chapter called Healing in a Mosaic of Moments Over Time. So if you open up the discord and, and look at it and it's all its complexity, then it, it helps you think of like a whole slew of things you can do to, to help things get better. And it's not just one thing that will fix it. Well, could you um, think of an example from your practice? Well, I mean, I can just give you, again, we can sort of stick with the story that, that we started with, because um, that has a lot of layers to it. So there was this, there's this kind of chronic unrepaired mismatch of, of no and tantrum, no tantrum, no tantrum. This is like the whole day is filled with that. So how do we find our way to repair that? So it, it involves, if we understand that some of it is biology, some of it is this child feeling the world intensely and, and, and easily getting disorganized. So part of the solution is then uh, helping the child to feel calm in her body. And that, you know, there are many ways you can do that, whether it's like uh, going for a walk or jumping jacks or whatever kinds of things that help the child to feel calm in their body. You have uh, a parent who's, you know, phenomenally stressed and has no breathing room uh, to recognize that 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 is not working, <laughs> and and that that uh, also needs to be. As, and again, this is not about blame. This is about acknowledging that parents need their own kind of support in order to be able to to listen to their child and meet their child where they are. So that's another layer of it. How how does this mom find a way to uh, address her own self-care given the limited resources then there's in the moment like how how do you uh address the the actual event when there's a meltdown so then there's a little bit of like quote-unquote behavior management like special time or or time out for hurting behavior so so there's there's many different layers to it as we kind of unravel the different strands of meaning um, to the child's behavior. And it doesn't take, it sounds like it's an enormous task, but it, it actually takes a lot less time than the alternative, which is to just squash the behavior. And then it pops up here and there in, in often worse forms, if you haven't really addressed what are the underlying issues. I want to go back a little bit. I remember um, reading through your book, you talk about the parent as the child's neuro architect literally yes. kind of shaping who they are. That sounds very dramatic, but can you go into that a bit? Yeah. So, well, I mean, this is also, all these ideas are based in neurobiology. You know, that the neuron connections in the brain are made in the context of relationships with other people. So um, that when you have this kind of interaction with, with, uh, your caregiver that that literally builds your brain. That's how brain connections are made. It's not like the brain, like if you take a baby and have them have no interaction with anyone, which there were these horrible sort of natural experiments in, in orphanages, their brains don't grow. So, and they die actually, you know, in the worst of circumstances. But that also, you need to 
present that or think about that in the context of the good enough mother, because it makes, it can make parents feel terrified. Oh my gosh, I I'm responsible for growing my baby's brain. <laughs> it can lead people to be paralyzed. But if you understand that the, the brain grows in the most and robust and healthy way through the mistakes that you make in your interaction with your child. So it's not that you have to be perfect. You just need to be in the messiness. You need to be willing to kind of have things be difficult and figure out what's going on and and find a way to repair and kind of embrace the messiness. Like, wow, that was really a tough time we went through. But look how strong we are as a family for having gone through a new baby and a pandemic together. Wow. Like, look at us now, how robust a family we are. Like you learn um, problem solving skills and how to be. I think problem solving skills is a good way to put it, but I think it's problem solving in relation to another person. Mm-hmm. So, so it's not, you know, it's not like, it's not a purely kind of cognitive process. It's actually the, in the interaction, you figure things out together. You know, for example, when a child is having a, a meltdown and a parent recognizes that they're overwhelmed and they're regressed. Because that often happens. Like a child is four and a parent thinks, well, why are they acting like they're a baby? But that's what happens. When kids are extremely stressed, they regress. And especially if they've had early developmental disruptions. So if a parent just stays with a child and lets helps them through it, So it's not like we're sitting there together and saying, okay, so now you want a cookie and you can't have a cookie. How are we going to figure out what to do about that? No, it's not that kind of problem solving. It's the parent saying, okay, I get it that you are not able to hold yourself together right now. So you just, you know, kick and scream and I'll just sit here with you and we'll just be together until you can breathe and I can breathe. And then you come down and I come down and you see that I will stay with you when you're at your absolute worst. Hmm. And then we will get to the other side of this tantrum and we will have, I mean, you could say we've solved this problem together, but it's not, again, it's not in just thoughts and ideas, but it's literally in your being together and breathing together and, and having that kind of presence together that you work through the mismatch to the repair. So with this good enough mother or good enough father or good enough caregiver, Mm -hmm. what are the things to bear in mind to ensure that the mismatch repair process takes place? And if it doesn't, how can it eventually be healed? Yeah, so certainly things can get like uh, really derailed so that, so let's say you have, as a parent, you're extremely anxious and you have a really hard time tolerating any mismatch. So there is, there's not any repair because there's no mismatch. So, so that's a situation where some kind of uh, support is needed. (laughs) And, and that support can take many forms. It can be, you know, what I do, which is uh, infant parent therapy, or it can be in the context of being with a group of other parents or, uh, self-care, what I was talking about, you know, so, so that a parent who feels is so anxious about, often they're anxious about their child's well-being. Um, so having a chance to take care of that, the mother's anxiety, can help to get to a place where she can tolerate some mismatch. Mm-hmm. So now then there are other more extreme examples. Um, so the, So that's when there's no repair because there's no tolerance of mismatch. The other kinds of things that can happen are there, there's too long a time to repair. So for example, um, you can think of ex- extreme examples where the parent is dealing with substance use issues so that th- their mental status is not reliable. So obviously then the treatment of that situation would be treatment of the substance use. <laughs> You know, so th- so there. I can give you many of, of examples where things have gone really bad, and that's when you really need to address what's going on for the parent. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are other sort of in between situations where, let's say, there's a new baby and a move. So all sorts of things are happening for the parent, so that they're kind of overwhelmed and they're not available for 
that repair. So then addressing the need, this is again, noticing it. Okay, this is too much. We need to sort of get some reinforcements in here because I'm too overwhelmed to be with my child in the way that they need me to be. Well, you, you do mention in your book and other writings about the, the, good, news, the good news of neuroplasticity so that, mm-hmm. that uh, to put it very crudely, if, if you're kind of been messed up, there's still a chance to, um, to repair, I guess. Can you explain a little about neuroplasticity? Yeah, so the, there's extensive evidence that the brain you know, changes over our entire lifetime. So it's not like it's, you know, baked in the cake if things did not go well in your early development. But the still face paradigm shows us that if we want to change, if if you think about the way we are in the world is created out of hundreds of thousands of moments of interaction. So we need hundreds of thousands of different kinds of interactions to create a new kind of sense of ourselves in the world. Um, So let's say... Uh, we experience a lot of unrepaired mismatch for whatever reason as a child. So then if you are in relation with a partner, uh, a yoga instructor, an exercise class, uh, siblings, friends, uh, psychotherapy, martial arts, you know, a whole, even in your, your uh, work world, like a, a whole slew of different kinds of relationships that offer you uh, an opportunity to have a new way of being where there is more chance of mismatch and repair. So it sort of flies in the face of traditional mental health care, which tends to be very, quite uh, unidimensional and, and, you know, like, okay, you'll do six weeks of CBT and it'll be different. Not to say that CBT doesn't have a lot of uh, value. It's just that if you think about how, we are in the world is something that is developed over time. Anything that's just six weeks and it's just one thing is not going to do the whole trick. (laughs) Yeah. For any listeners who don't know, CBT stands for cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I think most listeners probably do know it's become pretty well known. So you had mentioned about the, the medical model of, of mental health, how is that problematic for you when you're trying to look at things from the, pr- well, the perspective of the mismatch and repair and, and how you approach things? So this is such a, a, a tricky area. Um, so let's start with the idea that our sense of ourselves in the world is created in relation to other people. So we don't just sort of arrive fully formed as ourselves, <laughs> So that in order to understand why we are the way we are, whether we're kind of in general a a hopeful, engaged, connected person or an anxious, restricted person or a depressed person, you have to understand how we are in relation to other people. So, so, So this whole premise that you say that something exists within a person, uh, doesn't really make sense because our emotional well-being and our sense of ourselves is a developmental process over time Mm. with other people. I'm hesitating because I have to say this morning, I was reading an article about stigma and about how uh, when you don't use the word illness, somehow that's a stigma. And and we can get sort of all tangled up in language because by, by naming something, you're saying that it is this at this moment of time. And if we're saying the way we are in the world is a developmental process in relation to other people, to, to name someone as having anxiety or depression, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you can have a, an experience of feeling anxious or feeling depressed, but because our sense of ourselves in the world is a developmental process over time in relation to other people, uh, the medical model of disease really falls short because it's just saying this is who you are at this moment in time. Right. Does that make sense? It, yeah, very much so. It kind of freezes you in time when that in reality is kind of the polar opposite of that, that we're never this in a way we're never the same person twice. Yeah. It, we're, we're constantly changing. We're constantly changing in relation to other people. So just to give it, you know, a, a very concrete example 
is this dilemma of ADHD. So now there, people are saying, um, is it ADHD or is it trauma? So this is the same thing. We're trying to have this kind of certainty that when a child is, is struggling emotionally, we have to name it as one or the other. Hmm. Or now we have uh, PTSD. So, so again, these are these kind of names. And I get that we need to have names because we need to be able to communicate with each other. We need to get services for people. We have insurance. So I get that there's a need to name it. But when you, the, the problem with naming it is that the thing becomes, comes to exist only within the child. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that kids can have a variation in attention um, and activity level, but if they live in a home that's very high conflict and high stress, that they're more likely to reach the level of behavior that's then diagnosed as ADHD. So you can't really understand the, the behavior outside of its context. Um, and the risk is that if you do that, you... You, you lose sight of the relationships and the context. And that's really where you need to be in order to heal things. Now, this gets very tripped up in things about blame and stigma. So I think what we need to be able to do is to, to, under, to understand people without blaming and, and certainly without stigmatizing, that we just, to, to appreciate the, the complexity and the relational developmental context of our emotional experience shouldn't be equated with stigma and blame. It should just be that that's just the way it is. That's what our the developmental science shows us. So we've been talking about things parents can learn and do. Um, what about mental health professionals and therapists out there? How do these ideas speak to how maybe they should think about looking at kids who are troubled or quote unquote manifesting symptoms? Yeah, well, I think the core idea, and this is actually what's in my first book, Keeping Your Child in Mind, is to recognize that, that behavior has meaning. But that has profound implications for our whole system of mental health care. It means being able to have a a 50 minute rather than a 20 minute appointment. It means having, being able to create like a, a safe space where you just listen to the story rather than being uh, constricted by symptom checklists and diagnoses that you will, that your practice allows you to really take time. Like I told you about that first story of that five-year-old and you know, that only took 50 minutes. It wasn't a lot of time, but it's, it's using your time in a different way from does this person meet the criteria for X diagnosis and then we're going to do Y treatment. It's having this kind of openness, kind of embrace, you know, one, one of the phrases that Winnicott used is to allow us as clinicians to not know what's going on. So to just be in a room and hear the story and not feel pressured to make a diagnosis, to have an answer, but really to let ourselves hear the full story. And it really, it takes time, but it doesn't take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It takes kind of a different stance, a different idea of what your task is. It's, your task is not to eliminate the behavior, but to make sense of what the child is communicating. Then that leads you in a different direction. Uh, I'm just going to talk about another book I wrote, which is specifically for mental health professionals, which is called The Developmental Science of Early Childhood, because there's a tremendous base of knowledge uh, that uh, helps inform the way we listen to these stories. It's just that the people who do the work often don't have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so my hope is that more people who are in the mental health professional profession will get exposed to uh, the developmental science of early childhood, because that really helps to make sense of the story in a way that points to meaningful treatment. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave listeners with? Well, I, I feel like it's probably a good idea to connect what I'm talking about with the world we're living in today, you know, with, with the pandemic. And, and I think that the, the model that we describe in the book is one that says that 
sort of on the micro level, like with people who are stuck at home and under a tremendous amount of stress because of the pandemic and all the things that it's done to families and schools and daycare is that we have so much opportunity to be in messiness. <laughs> uh, and so that we really need to, when we're all home together, um, to pay attention to repair, like that there are going to be times where people are upset with each other and things are really difficult, but then that if we can as families and on a more individual level uh, really protect the time to say, okay, that really did not go well. I was really upset. We're all stressed out. Let's find a way to connect to each other. So that's on the micro level, but sort of on the societal level, you know, there have been some very, very deep injustices in our world for centuries mm -hmm. that are now being exposed. And I think is to recognize that it, we need to be in this kind of disorganizing time. And, and my hope, and, and the, the book and the message is really one of hope, is that if you, you know, really work through this discord in a difficult kind of painful time, that that, that is what will allow us to really make meaningful change and to grow as a society. That, that, that we we can't just smooth it over anymore. We have to really get into the messiness of what's what what's the what's been going on uh, for centuries in order to grow in a different direction. Excellent, because a society is just really a collection of human beings in relationship. Exactly. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Claudia Gold. Well, thank you for having me. Our guest has been pediatrician Claudia Gold, MD. You can visit her website at www.claudiamgoldmd.com and look for her blogs at Madden America. I'm Miranda Spencer, and this has been Mad in the Family. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.